Q&A on our first Friday of the month. So let's pray. So Father, we thank you for this time of study and insight into looking into your word, hearing from you, having your spirit guide, direct, teach, counsel, correct, encourage, edify us. We ask you to continue to uh, walk us through your understanding of your word, to see things from your perspective, as we know your ways are not our ways, and your thoughts are not our thoughts. So we thank you for loving us and continuing to forge in us the proper mindset, the proper uh, views of you, of scripture, of our worldview, of our lives, of other people around us. But again, our relationship with you is where it starts, and we ask you as we now look into these questions as we seek to hear from you, from your word, from understanding what you have uh, to expound for us, and as you continue to bless and encourage and benefit us from being drawn closer to you and understanding of opening up these things to us in your word, we thank you. We're grateful to you, and we continue to ask you to keep us in that mindset of grounded in gratitude, grounded in thankfulness for what you have already done, regardless of what happens from here on out. You've already done so much, giving us life physically, giving us life spiritually, and then you just expound that with the depth of understanding of who you are in your word and giving us the love from you in extra measure, our families, continuing expanded families, and Father, we just thank you for it all. So be with us now, time of study, guide and direct and teach and encourage us. May you be our shepherd, our Lord, our counselor, our pastor, our teacher, our shepherd in this time. In Jesus, Yeshua's name we pray, amen. All right, so today's lesson, again, is going to be a, a, a Q&A, actually, I should say, not a lesson, but a Q&A. As we do, and for those who may hear this on a recording, we do the Q&A the first Friday of the month. And so this is April's Q&A. And a, and a hangover from, I should say hangover, a carryover, excuse me, from last month is uh, from uh, Sister Tracy in regards to the two questions that you asked uh, that we're going to start off with first. That's only proper, as I always do as a tradition. I just start in order of how I receive them in chronological request via uh, text or email or otherwise. In this case, again, from last month, uh, we got two from Tracy, we got two from Laney, we got two from Sheila, and we got one from Todd. So that's what we're going to be doing uh, tonight and, and getting through uh, these, was it seven? Yeah. Uh, seven questions in regard to our Q&A. If any others uh, crop up or others um, dovetail out of these, uh, either way, uh, that's more than welcome to be something that we continue to, to uh, address as the Lord leads. So tonight, as we embark, we're on the first uh, scripture that Tracy asked, uh, and the phrasing you used, you said, unpack Matthew 19, 14. So turn to Matthew chapter 19, and this is something that is regarding the kingdom of the heavens, and uh, it actually speaks to a little bit of one of the videos that I did regarding what is the kingdom in regards to how uh, churchianity, as I call it, which is the traditional thoughts of denominationalism and of pulpit teaching and whatnots that take anything that says kingdom, anything that says heaven, thing that says kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven, they make it all one general swooping broad stroke, all the same thing. And that's not true. So that's important to understand because in this context, in Matthew 19, 14, Jesus, Yeshua, said, let the little children, and the word there is padia, and padia is pation, as we know, it's a singularity, so it's a uh, padia, a male or female, a young child, uh, comparable to our vernacular of a toddler, two years and upward, right? So it is a person who is, uh, but of what seed, right? Of what growth cycle? On the spiritual growth cycle chart, uh, you will know there's two types of padia. Again, for those who are tuning in, and even for, even for those of us who are hearing now, it's always good to remember that the spiritual growth cycle chart and the duality of growth, I mean, you're a brephos on two occasions, you're a, uh, you're a nepios and a pation and a technon and a and a none east goes and then a near on two different occasions, people that scratch their head. So right now, those words I just said, somebody may go, what are you talking about, man? Those are Greek words that represent the legitimacy within scripture of words that are used in the Koine Greek that express the growth of a human and physical nature. Uh, brephos, regarding in the womb and out of the womb, helping. And then nepios, they begin to crawl. Nepios, uh, ne uh, they're, they're in that, so again, the crawl stage. Mikros, they begin to crawl, then they fall in the tushy. They can't, really, uh, they walk, I should say. They walk and fall in tush. They can't walk independently just yet, learning to do that. Um, and then Pation, um, they begin to be two years old toddlers. And then you, I should say, yeah, so then you have um, Technon, they're children, uh, used often from people, uh, the teenage, 12 years old and teenage years. Meniscos, young adults, 
and then a, a New Year's Global Dome. So you have this cycle. Well, why does it happen twice? Well, the same way we see, again, in our common academic world is the best way to show this, and that is you have freshman, sophomore, junior, and senior. In high school, you have that same thing duplicated in college. Why? Because it's a higher level of education. One is free or cost, depending on pub public or private schooling, right? But one is always a fee, and that's college, right? Unless you're Bernie Sanders and it's all free, right? No, <laughs> that's tongue in cheek being funny. So the reality is that you have the, the, the whole aspect of, of the higher learning and the higher fee and cost to that. Uh, we all know we're all accustomed to being called freshmen again in college, even though you graduated as a senior from high school. Well, when you go through the sporos growth up to the near, then you start fresh with a new level of understanding. You go from understanding the word of God, full capacity, not that you fully understand it, but you've understood the different levels and dynamics of the word of God, from which now God, by his permission, not your desires and not your will and not your efforts, by his desire to show you Hebrews 6, 3, these things we do if God permits, he then invites you, just like a college accepts you. You don't just barge into Princeton and say, I'm going to class today. They got to accept you. They got to, <laughs> I mean, come on. And then you got to pay after that, right? So the reality is that the Lord has to, he has to bring you in through what he calls the invitation, uh, as a, I should say, an, an eclego, uh, an election, uh, that you receive that understanding of hearing it, and then you have to grow by hearing it to understanding it and so on. Well, this patio person, as little children of the kingdom of the heavens, has been claytoyed, if you look on your chart, to the glorious invitation, and they've had some peace they reconciled with the sovereignty of God. So with that in mind, it's a person who's not just some little kid who's just some, you know, sucking on their thumb, pacifier, playing with the blanket. No, 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 no. A little child, spiritually speaking, is, is in view of the physicality of a, of a child in view here. Uh, that is, again, he says, forbid them, uh, you know, let, the children, little, let the little children alone and forbid them not or suffer them not to come to me because to such as these or similar like as these belong the kingdom of the heavens. So the reference to this verse is referencing to, in real time, little kids were coming up on Jesus' lap and so forth. And you have uh, children being shown here as metaphors of children's uniformity of thought, whether you're a pation and the word of God, the sporos, the word, the word of the God, or if you're a pation in the seekers of the kingdom of the God. It doesn't matter which one you are when it comes to this, the character trait that's similar. And that is, you have a very trusting heart. You have a very trusting soul about yourself. You just, you innately have a, an, a, a, an ignorance about things. And so you have this, what we call innocence. Even though you're guilty, there's that childhood innocence. So we would, and as adults, we call it naivete, right? <laughs> so you're naive to not knowing that people are manipulative, that people are backstabbing, sinful, evil, greedy uh, connivers at heart. And they are deceptively wicked and evil. And they do things that are insanely crazy. We have older men that are in their 40s that would marry, rape, pillage, take advantage of teenage girls. One would think, what the heck is that? Even single digit age girls, right? So. How does that happen sometimes? Sometimes it's against their will, obviously, for a large part of it. But there are times they do that because they coercively convince them that, what's wrong with that? There's a lot wrong with that, OK? You just can't sit here and take a, a young girl and just you know, do that to them. But the reality is that when he says girls or boys, little children, we see in, the, we see in some people taking, taking priests in this situation. No offense to our Catholic friends, but the reality is true. They molest little boys. Right? So we see boys and girls alike of younger ages. We know this for a fact in the history of humankind. They have been abused. We have to this day people in Africa being, being forced, being forced to kill their families and then take up arms, learn weaponry at a young, young age, and then go out and just start killing people. It's insanity. So when he says suffer the children not, he means from their, their, their character trait of being impressionable, very trusting, very, very open and, and, and willing just to take in the authority of the adult that means well by them, 
that they fear the authority over them in some ways, that they have a respect there. There are certain traits these kids have. And so Pation and Spirit have those similar traits. They're very trusting, they're very impressionable, they're very still new in their naivete about not understanding the depth of what Scripture really means and how it affects the tentacles of everything else. But the basic genre they, they, they kind of get, trust in God and what he says, don't question it. Believe that he's going to be there to always, you know, explain whatever isn't so-called explainable to you at the time. Know that no problem is too big and no mountain's too tall. He can get you over it and pass you through it and whatnot, right? And trust that all things that he's in control, that all things that led you to that point, he's got this. And just be in the moment. Notice how kids, if people say they have ADHD, but the reality is they, they when they're in that moment uh, with Jesus, the idea is that adults sometimes get distracted by our obligations, by our responsibilities. And many would claim that kids have ADHD and whatnot. But the reality is that when these kids are with Jesus, uh, you're going to be hard-pressed to convince me that they were going, oh, there's Peter. Oh, there's John. Let's go talk to them. They weren't distracted by the apostles. They were all on him. So the idea is a pation has an innocence about themselves, that they're trusting, that they're focused on him, that they're trusting in him, that they're impressionable, they're hanging on his every word. So that's the, the, these character traits that are embodied in, in a pation is that they're just, they're like, again, if you ever, I mean, I've, we've done this, Dave and I have done this. We've taught a class in Sunday school at an old congregation over in, in Texas, and it was the, the toddlers. And, and I remember that's, a, that's the most endearing moment of any interaction I've ever had with any kind of a kid is in that toddler stage. And if you know what I'm talking about, in that toddler stage, and you all know this, having kids and grandkids and whatnot, you all know that at that stage, they are the most, they say the terrible twos. I, I say it's the awesome twos because they, they, they are so fun and so filled with energy as a boy, as a girl, they're so inquisitive, they're so like, you know, it, it, it's just really endearing moment in time of their life where they can forge a lot of goods and bads about how they view their adults in their life and God and so forth. And so I find it, I found it very endearing myself. I found it very um, emotionally uh, memorable, memorable uh, around those age of kids, no matter if I interacted them with one day or weeks or months or whatnot, even if our own, and our own kids and grandkids. So I, I think that when he says little children here, that's always, always what comes to my mind is that my personal experience with that, I can only imagine what it was like with these kids in Christ. So when he says, let the children not suffer them not to come unto me, for, for like is the kingdom of heavens, he's talking about, in this particular case, in this specific definition, the kingdom of the heavens is, is a, a reference to the inherit, the entrance, the least to the inheritance of the upper sphere, which is only for the minority of people that are going to be able to attain such a thing. And we know that these pation are given this entrance, and so we know from reading Matthew 22, when there's these giftedness of these, these, these garments given out, there's this invitation given that wasn't earned, it was given out. And so we know that kids were, didn't have access on their own because of course you have this apostle like, you know, like, like mafia style, they were guarding the, the, the people from getting to Jesus and that's why he says suffer them not because the idea was they were you know, putting a shield out there and yet the kids just forge right through their lack and just see them running through the leg, getting behind them, you know, they're wiggling through because they're just so anxious and so excited to see Jesus. There's this, there's this genuineness of, of no pretense, of no ulterior motives, of no uh, association of pride or arrogance. It's just so good to be in that age, right? Because you just don't, all, you're a sinner, don't get me wrong. You're selfish and you're, and you're you, know, you know, a jerk in some ways, I'm sure, if you're a little boy or girl. But the reality is, you don't have those adult problems and hang-ups that cost you years of life of your growth and spirit with God and his word. You know, things like pride and arrogance and, and, and preconceived notions and trying to, again, uh, presume upon him are adult problems. Kids don't have those problems as a toddler. Let's face it, they don't have those problems. They don't do that stuff. We do. So he says, come to me, suffer, not, suffer the... The kids not for like is kingdom of the heavens. He's talking about that is what is the people that I'm going to give entrance to that have as an adult been of those character traits, but also as children, that's the character trait that they have. Knowledge level is way different, no doubt about it. 
but the character trait is where it starts. So he's mentioning to you the emphasis of that verse is on two things. One, the group specifically he's talking about is of a lack of knowledge process and, a, and, and within the kingdom of the heavens, but yet they have been, again, invited at a higher level, but they're still new to this higher level of knowledge. So it's a higher level of knowledge being given, but again, to a lower shelf knowledge, they haven't grown in it yet. Physically, it's talking about the actual child themselves being of those character traits I just mentioned, which leads to the fact that that is what, that's the foundational embodiment of what he wants everybody who's within earshot to understand. I don't care, he's basically saying, I don't care who you think you are, Jew, Gentile, Pharisee, Sadducee, scribe, elder, throwaway, cast off fisherman, idiot, dumb person, you may be called, Samaritan. I don't care what society tells you that you are, uh, a, degra a degraded woman, uh, a, a, no, a non-valued different skin tone person. That's not true. Whatever society tells you, he says, forget about it for a second. Forget it. Forget the gender bias, the ethnic culture bias, the whole thing. Forget it all. Of all you think you know, you're wrong. For like these children, he didn't say like these Jewish children. He said like these children. He didn't say like these female children. He said like these children. He didn't say like these culturally, ethnically. No. It didn't matter, the gender, the ethnicity, or the culture. What mattered was their character traits, or what embodies a pation. A pation is very accepting, and again, and very, very much, again, trusting, and again, they're excited just to be there. And so it speaks to that element of the mentality, of the foundation of what we build on as we grow in the knowledge of the kingdom of the heavens. The knowledge is secondary, because that's the seed that grows. The level that it grows is, is greatly determined by the soil that's represented in these patios. As we all started there, and we learned this higher truth, and he's reminding us to remember to stay rooted in the elements of the simplicity of that which is fundamental and how we get better at acclimating and applying the knowledge that is so great in its depth and width and length and height. We need to have the knowledge to then experience correctly who God is but you're not gonna have that knowledge fully understood and applied and discerned correctly unless you're rooted in those fundamental character traits that are embodied when you were back with a kid. I remember going to a class one time and a gentleman, he was teaching Communication 101. And it's a true class I went to through work years ago. And one of the things he said to some of the two-day class of 16 hours, he said, when you're kids, we all look at mom and dad come home sometimes from work or we get home from school, how you want to phrase it, and we may see mom and dad had a bad day. We may notice on their face a joyful look of fun, happiness, or just a, a look of just they respect. And the kid, as a kid, you as a boy or girl, it doesn't matter, you would say to your, to your mom and dad, you look sad, mommy. You look sad, daddy. What's wrong? But as adults, we go right to the, we don't go, we don't acknowledge, which is what he was talking about, a kid's acknowledged by saying you. We as adults don't ask, don't state the acknowledgement. We go right past it and go right to the, what's up? What happened? Or say it nicely, what happened? You look sad. What about the acknowledgement that, we see we say it last, what happened? We ask first, then we say you look sad. So he says as kids, we just don't even, we, we just innately know to acknowledge. Whereas adults, it becomes so, so difficult for us to acknowledge, we don't even recognize that we're not doing it. And by not doing it, it's the, most, it's the most depreciative way to treat somebody without realizing it. You're cutting their legs out from under them and you're devaluing them, whether consciously or subconsciously, by not acknowledging them. By simply starting a conversation or having a conversation, you should always say the word you when you start to answer a question, when you start a statement to a person. You should say you, so that you're acknowledging the person in front of you so it makes them feel like, you know, wow, I actually matter. Because innately, your subconscious, when you hear those words, those, that word, I should say, those letters, Y-O-U, your ears just perk up because it's just how we are. And it's just interesting how these children acknowledge Jesus. They just acknowledge him as he's all that matters to them. Nothing else matters. You wouldn't see them jockeying in about who's going to be the greatest. You don't see that ever happening. But you, but you see the adults doing that, foolishness. But you don't see the kids doing they're too busy being wrapped up in Jesus, you know? So I hope that answers your question, Tracy, but I'll stop there. Again, I kind of went on a little preaching there. 
But does that answer your question about Matthew 19, 14 satisfactorily? You tell me, yes or no. So I'm just going to sum that up by saying they are representative of character traits fundamental to learning. I wonder what? Don't they have uh, two ears to um, first go to get into that higher echelon? No. Remember that the fruit yields of the kingdom of the heavens to enter, you are correct, are 30, 60, and 100, which starts at the Beniscos level. So the question would be, how do, how do Mikros, how do tech, Technon, excuse me, Technon, Pation, and Mikros get in? Those are the poor, in Matthew 22's uh, expo extrapolation, remember he invites the poor and the good and the bad. So there is, re there is represented in those three types of people those who are undeserving of recognizable fruit but yet are gifted a level of compassion and graciousness by God. So you are correct. They're supposed to have a fruit yield. They do not have one. So those don't reconcile. Well, then how are they there? By a grant by the God Loves You Foundation because God gave his good graces in Matthew 22 exemplified in that story of the parable to let you know that he invites people. Is it Matthew 22 or 20? Hold on, let me, let me, let me quote in the wrong one. Hold on a second. 22 or 24, is it? Am I saying the wrong one? Let me find out just a moment. No, I'm 22. 22. And that's in uh, verse 10. Those servants went out into the roads and brought together all they met, good and bad to the feast. You're spot on with that. You are correct with the fruit yield issue. But it just goes, and by the way, what does that typify of what's going on on the earth? Is that on the earth you have earthy ones who enter but are not, in, but not heirs, but they're not in the place of consequences of Hades or Gehenna or whatnot. Well, they're kind of in between. Well, what's, that's indicative of the same thing you have in the heavenlies. People who are there who didn't earn the right to be there, but they're given a, a level of graciousness by God to at least be able to enter with those who did put forth a collaborative obedience and results that God p positioned them there. So in both fashions, on the, on the heavens, in the heavens or on the earth, God gives gracious latitude to folks who fell short. How awesome is our God? No matter if you're an earthly person or a heavenly person, there is gracious latitude he gives. So those who say, God's a meanie. No, no he's not. He's more than gracious, more than lenient. He's got the greatest bell curve ever, okay? So it's, it's really fantastic when you see it for what it is. But within that, there is rules, and there is reality of accountability and so forth. But good follow-up question. Yes? And Tracy said, so on Abraham, righteousness? There you go, exactly. And we're going to look later in Laney's question about that word righteousness is associated, and it doesn't mean that they're perfect by any means with the people mentioned in Ezekiel. We'll, look, we'll get to that, but case in point, you're correct. He was credited righteousness. Doesn't mean that he was, you know, without exemption of sin in his life or found not doing what he should do. I mean, after all, he did not follow God in the face of one uh, clearly saying that, you know, Sarah was his wife and Pharaoh even called him out on that and said, hey, whoa, boy, hey, man, you didn't tell me she was your wife. I almost, you know, committed a crime here in essence, taking your wife from me. And so he let him go and then God's like, come on. And then later on, he you know, says, oh, the siege to me and uh, this kid I adopted from, from Egypt, Eliezer. And God says, uh, no, that's a negative. Oh, you mean this one kid from me and, and Hagar? Uh, no. Sounds like I tell you, you and your wife. You and your wife. I'll say it again. You and your wife. He got it wrong twice. So it isn't like he's like, you know, with it when it comes to trusting and by obedience. But given the contrast and comparison of being a sinner 
given he's a sinner, which means we're all like, Bleh, when it comes to listening here from God, given the, the latitude that God gives, the bell curve he gives, right? He's righteous. We just credit him for righteousness because he obeyed when it mattered most, I guess you could say, or how God saw it. Yes. Amen to that. I'm not going to argue that. Then your next uh, verse you had was Revelation 14, 13. So let's turn there. Revelation 14, 13. Revelation 14, 13. And here it says, And I heard a voice uh, from heaven saying, Right from this time, blessed are those dead who die in the Lord, yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors for their works, follow after them. And we bring this up because you said you heard it on a live streaming of the funeral for Billy Graham, how it was used to represent him passing on, and this verse, they say, applied to him, and they do this a lot with people that have served the Lord. Inaccurate application, totally. It says nothing to do with the man. We already talked about the man, Billy Graham, being a very uprighteous, Again, same, relatively righteous, right, because he's still a sinner. Given his integrity as a husband, as a father, as a man of God, his consistency of his message of loving, forgiveness, and acceptance, you're not going to take anything away from him, but he has nothing to do with this verse. And nor does this verse have anything to do with diminishing what I just said about that man. It's just not applicable, that's all. But people apply it because of their ignorant vanities of seeing a general sense of what fits a narrative that makes them comforted by a difficulty emotionally in life. So let's go through what the verse is really saying. Left side of your margin, he says, and I heard a voice out of the heavens. This is your diagonal left side of your margin, Revelation 14, 13. And I heard a voice out of the heavens saying, write thou blessed ones, oi necroi, the dead ones, those, oi, those there, basically, in Lord, dying from henceforth, yes, says the Spirit, so that they may rest out of the labors of themselves. The but works, or but the works of them follows with them, or meta them, closely. Or the word with is accompanied them. So what is he talking about? The context here is about the tribulation period, which you read verse or chapter 14. We all know the context here is that period of time. It's got nothing to do with just any Tom, Dick, or Harry, Susie Q, Sally, whoever, who's just walking through life from the annals of time, who's saying, hey, by the way, I believe in Jesus, and I died, and you see my works follow after me because... I'm now dead. No, 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 no. Come on, man. It's got nothing to do with that. The context is about those, if you look over and he says, the oinecroi, those are those brephos and, and nephios of, of sperma. Those are those oinecroi, those that are basically, as we know, that are unsanctified, unfruitful of the sperma in the tribulation period. And it says that those in the Lord, and, and now at the mid-trib, they become fruitful because, remember, we have some people who are, don't forget. See, this is going to be, people who would not, there's no way you're going to know Revelation 14, 13, unless you know what dead ones mean, unless you know there's a different sphere of heaven and earth kingdoms, fashions of the earth and the heavens, right? the difference between entrance and inheritance. You have to know the difference of those things, or else there's no way you got a shot of understanding Revelation 14, 13. So what I'm telling you now, the average person in Christ is going to go, okay, it's over their head. They're not going to have a clue what I'm saying. So all I do, people, people say, you're reading into what it says. It says dead, man. Dead means dead. Just relax. It's the best verse of all time. I get people to understand, just in English, not going to the Greek. To understand why there is a Greek depth of meaning here, what dead ones means isn't just physical. As I say, do you remember the verse when Jesus said, let the dead bury the dead? And they go, yes. Of course, you've all heard that. Because it's in the Bible. But think about what you just said you understood Jesus said. Do you think people come up from the grave? Uh, the zombie. Uh. No, come on, man. 
dead folks don't come back to life as zombies and then bury the dead. Think what he is saying. He's not talking about the literal dead coming back to life to bury the dead. Come on, man. You know that to be true, that that's not what he's talking about. So if you know that's clearly not what he's talking about, then did you ever think about what he is talking about? If it's not physical, then it must be, wait, wait for it, spiritual. Of course it is. Of course it is. That's why Paul writes in Ephesians, awake the dead, you sleeper, right? So he talks about life in the spirit and death in our sin and our flesh. And so the dead ones is a spiritual context or physical context, the word dead in English. So the Greek helps to explain what that's about. So the oi necroi is specific to, to the oi is a those there. And that oi is specific to those dead ones that are in the sperma that are unfruitful and, and unwritten sanctified. So that's what he's talking about here in Revelation 14, 13. Then he goes and he says it again, that word oi, those in the Lord. So those in, so he's telling you, th these aren't just, you know, people that are just dead or just anybody who's dead. He says those, oi, those there. Well, why is he pointing out? Why is he, what's he pointing out? Those there who? Who? Because the context is about the tribulation period and it lets you know what the metacoid means. Another key that you have to understand or else you're going to not understand this verse. You have to know what metacoid means, meaning to have a place with Christ closely with him. Uh, you partake with him closely. Meta, meaning with closely, and, and metakoi is you're partaking with him. But koinonoi is partaking with him, but now you add suffering to it. And if you'll say, what? Well, yeah. It's almost like saying, the best way to explain metakoi and koinonoi in our English example of a life experience that husbands and wives and wives who have babies have gone through, the husband may be in the room with you when you're giving birth to your child, women. And so he is metakoi partaking with you and your birthing of your, chi of your child, of y'all's child. However, the koinonoi suffering partaking with you is by you and guess what? Oh, the child. The child and you are the only ones partaking in your pain of that experience. The husband is not. I don't care how much we want to feel for you, or even the doctor or the nurse, they got nothing to do with your pain and your labor and your suffering giving birth, right? Only you and your child are conducive to that cycle of that pain. You are sharing together in that painful cycle. Is, is he or she going through pain? I'm not saying that. I'm saying they are a part of it. And when they're a part of it, they are in a coin and relationship of fellowship of that partaking of that event. And there's a difference between metakoi and koinonoi. Metakoi partakes closely with, koinonoi partakes closely with, but they're in the midst of the suffering with you. You're together in it. There's a fellowship there. And so that is a different distinction, just like a, again, in that you know, labor room could be an example of how the best husband in the world can be there for his wife, but he can never say, I was with you in the suffering. And by the way, if you do say that, you're kind of ignorant because you're not. You're not in that suffering with her. You're just not. We can't do that. <laughs> but, so, but the child, when they grow up, your son or daughter could say, you know, I may not have remembered it, Mom, but I was actually, I was with you in that suffering because I'm the one who was causing it. <laughs> so, so I know, you know, I was a part of that. So the, you, could, you could share things that might resonate differently with that child than with the husband. I digress. The reality here is you continue on in Revelation 14, 13. He says, dying from henceforth. From henceforth when? They die. Die meaning to, you know, they die in their spirit. Die, die meaning what? At, from, thence, from henceforth, from what? From the midpoint of tribulation. Because the midpoint of tribulation is when the metakoi people, who are the unfruitful, unfaithful metakoi, of those, there's 144 that come to life and grow like a weed and produce fruit yield up to a hundred fruit, remember? And that's what was in context coincidentally in chapter 14 and the first, 14, and the first four verses. What a coincidence. You think that's a coincidence? No. That's what he's talking about, man. So it's not a coincidence. The chapter is, in the context is clear. 
those that die, those dead ones, those there, they, those ones who were earlier in chapter 14, 1 to 4, were the same ones who were not like that when the tribulation period started. Those dead ones in the Lord, those there, they died, and from henceforth, from that point forward, the midpoint forward, God accelerated, he, not them, he, boom, accelerated them to grow. And it says that the Spirit, so that they may rest out of the labors of the labors. So it's emphasizing the word the emphasizes. What, why is he emphasizing labors? Because their labor was more intense. Their labors they're resting from because their labors are greater intensity than the other people who they're going to come to the meeting in the Lord with that are already the bride of Christ, betrothed as such as the faithful ones. They're not revealed as that yet, but they're betrothed as that, and they're the faithful ones. And so you have these other group of faithful ones that will join them. And so they'll rest out of the emphatic the labors of them because their labors were much more intense given the frame of time and place that they were at because there were demonic, evil presence all around them. And it says, but the works of them follow with them or they accompany them. So that's what he's talking about in Revelation 14, 13. It's got nothing to do with just anybody in Christ. And again, all due respects and love to our brother in Christ, Billy Graham. It's got nothing to do with him because he doesn't, no offense. I'm not trying to be offensive. It doesn't apply to him. He has no knowledge of the things regarding that which the soon metacoy people who become of that group of unfaithful, unfruitful, unsanctified ones of that group, there's 144 that are taken out that become fruitful, sanctified, reconciled, and fruitful, and, and faithful. So there are a group of those that come out. He's not even in that group to be called out from that. Even if he was still alive now, he wouldn't be in that group. He just wasn't given that permission by God to see those things. And, but what he was given, he did a great job with it. So you can't fault the man. I'm not pointing a finger at the man. He's got nothing to do with this verse. Nor does this verse have anything to do with him. Okay. There's many verses in the Bible that don't deal with me or you, too. So nothing's, you know, it's just the way it is. I'm not trying to be ugly, just the way it is. So with that being said, Tracy, does that answer your question on that, um, rev on that, that scripture verse satisfactorily? Yes. Okay. All right. So, so I'm going to put on here, oi necroi. Context of... Ah, can't even spell. Context. Can you hear my spell? Scriptures. Now we go to Ezekiel 14, 14. Now we're in the Old Testament. Under our sister Laney's question uh, regarding Ezekiel chapter 14, verse 14. One of my verses that I use quite a bit to show people uh, what righteousness looks like according to the Lord in regard to an example that I think is just tremendous and asking how God and why he picked these people. But he's in context from verses 12 to 16. There's a context here. So the context, it should be 12 to 16. Because the issue is a contrast. Of righteousness. Among. Sinners. That's the issue. So look at Revelation, look at, excuse me, not really, Ezekiel 14, verses 12 to 16, the context, because the verse 14 is what we're going to get to. But in verse 12, he says, The word of the Lord came, on, came again unto me, saying, Son of man, when the land sinneth against me by trespassing grievously, then will I stretch out my hand upon it, and will break the staff of the bread, 
and will send famine upon it and will cut off man and beast from it. Though these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in it, they should deliver but their own souls by their righteousness, saith the Lord God. If I cause a noisome beast to pass through the land and they spoil it, so that it be desolate that no man may pass through because of the beast. Though these three men were in it, as I live, saith the Lord God, they shall deliver neither sons nor daughters, they only shall be delivered, but the land shall be desolate. So he's talking about the contrast between righteousness among the sinners. I get that, right? You get that. That's pretty clear, right? But the question is, why these three guys? Why is that? Why these three guys? What do they have in common? If you think about it, you'll come to that conclusion very quickly. You just dwell on it long enough for a while. I shouldn't say quickly. Pretty obviously, I should say. At first, you're going like, ah, man, scratch your head. Like, what's up with that? I want you to remember what they don't have in common. Is Noah a Jew? Ah, wrong. Let's go back to see what a Jew is, remember? A Jew is somebody from Judah. A Judah person is somebody from the loins of the son Judah from Jacob, who his name was changed to Israel. So you have to have an, be an Israelite first before you can say you're a Jew. Well, who's an Israelite? Where did the Israelites come from? Jacob came out of Isaac, who came out of who? Who's that again? Abram, and he was called a Hebrew. So you were a Hebrew who becomes an Israelite, who then is named a Jew. So was Noah a Jew, an Israelite, or a Hebrew? None of the above. None of them. Was Daniel a Hebrew? Yes. Was he an Israelite? Yes. <laughs> Was he a Jew? Yes. Check the box. Boom, boom, boom. Was Job a Hebrew? No. Was Job an Israelite? No. Was Job a Jew? No. One could argue that he was a Hebrew, but he definitively was not an Israelite or a Jew. You could argue he's a Hebrew because of the fact that in Edom, where his place of wealth was at, later on Esau was associated with Edom, and the Septuagint tells us that Job's associated with his dwelling being in that region. So many associate Esau and the Edomite people to Job and his people. Hence, since Esau came from Isaac and with Jacob, and he's definitely a Hebrew, therefore, is Job a Hebrew? Maybe. But the thing we can say for sure is that Job was a Semite, meaning he came from Shem. That I can tell you definitively. That he came from Shem. That, that, that much is clear, because God said, blessed be the God of Shem. And Job was a contemporary after Shem of Abram. And so therefore, you have him in that time frame. And, and we know that anybody who was blessed by God during that time, prior to him being declared, that is Abram, that is, anybody blessed by God uh, from out of the ark landing, uh, he said, blessed be the God of Shem. So it makes common sense to know that uh, Job was from Shem. So Semite. Okay, but he wasn't from the definitive Israelite or Jew. Maybe you can say Hebrew, or you can at least definitively say Semite. But that's some just contrasting I'm giving you there. What their uncommon traits are, they're not common in those ways at all. They're just distinctions that I just mentioned, right? So what is their commonality? Why would God point those three people out that I just mentioned? Really don't have any commonality there. There's no like common thread ties them together culturally, ethically, I should say ethnically, excuse me, ethnically or culturally. They're not tied together definitively by one thread. Of, of, there's not that there at all. Huh. Oh, uh, 
was there a judgment in Noah's day? Yeah, there was. There was that flood, you know, heard of that maybe? So Noah was spared in a time of God's judgment that we call it a flood. You go, so? What does that have to do with Daniel and Job? Wait, wait. Was Daniel alive during a time of judgment? Uh, yeah. You know, when God told Judah, I'm not playing with y'all. If I write you a bill of divorce, I'm so ticked because at least northern tribes of Israel, those ten yahoos who worship Baal and all 20 of their kings are straight up devil evil, all of them are straight up wicked. At least they know they are and they're saying they are and they believe they are and they're consistent. They say they're evil, they're doing evil because they are evil. But you in the south, he goes, y'all make me sick. But you say you're great and you love me and we got a temple and the ark. You will never destroy us. He's like, you make me sick because you go in for your Sabbath and all those rituals and you go out and sacrifice your kids. You make me sick. Your hypocrisy is disgusting. And he says, God, in Jeremiah 7, I would rather, I would rather that you be straight up evil than act like you're righteous and then do something unrighteous when you're not around me. It's disgusting. You frustrate me so much. You, you, in, you incite my anger so much, I wrote a bill of divorce. I didn't divorce you. Well, I wrote it out to let you know you disgust me. But you know what? I love you. But to show you your consequences, because you lift up your skirt, he said, by your false god worship, what God calls it, he calls false god worship the same as adultery. So when you as a man or a woman have someone step out on you and that hurts you emotionally, psychologically, spiritually, God says, that's what you do to me every time you put me second. I don't appreciate it. I don't like it. It purges my heart. It just pierces me through with a knife. How could you do that? After all the love and provision I give to you, why would you do it? How would you do it? Look us through your head. So he makes that clear. But he forgives and loves so much, he goes, tell you what, I'm going to put you in captivity. I'm going to judge you out of this land. I'm going to take this land. I'm going to take my own temple, decimate it. Take my own Ark of the Covenant, destroy it. Just to prove the point. Those are things I don't care about. I care about my character and my word and the principles of loving and worshiping me, and you don't understand any of those. So I'm going to eliminate that from the equation. I'm going to take you out of this land because you didn't listen to me. I told you every seventh year, let it lay fallow to re-encourage rich soil. So he takes them out, and he judges them in Babylon. And after they left Babylon, after they were there for 483 years, after they left, guess what they learned? They never again as a people all collectively worship the false god ever again. Groups of them that then and now still do that idiot stuff because we're still sinners and uh, idiots, right? But it doesn't mean as a people, collectively, they didn't do that anymore. <laughs> they learned that real well after they, le they left Babylon. Well, during that judgment, who was in the middle of that? Who was the one who was, who was taken into the king's royal chamber and given a high station of only second to Pharaoh, likened and akin to What's that Joseph guy? Oh, yeah. And what did Joseph and Daniel have in common? They both interpreted dreams. Well, that's funny. They both were blessed by God, brought into a foreign country that wasn't their own. They both were put second in command. They showed a, a deep mastery of mysteries and dreams interpretation. Interesting. But God doesn't mention Joseph. He mentions Daniel. Because Joseph didn't get called out during a time of judgment unto his people, Daniel did. Daniel was called out as God first through Noah. God judged humanity, and Noah was bring, brought out as a righteous person amongst that judgment. God points out Daniel because he was judging Judah, his righteous children that were left, supposedly, and he pulls out the one righteous amongst them. How amazing is that? You go, okay, so you show me similarity between Daniel and Noah, both were called out as righteous in a time of judgment of God's heavy hand coming down of consequence because of our behaviors against them. But, but Job was righteous. But, 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 but Job, it says that Job was at God's 
who's God's champion? What, what, what judgment? What, what did he, well, how, he was righteous from what judgment? Wait for this one. Um, yeah. Uh, he was righteous from the judgment, dare I say, from God himself to show his heavy hand, not because Job was unrighteous, not because Job was a sinner, not because humanity was a sinner, not because of anything else, but for God to show his mighty hand and to show the template of humanity, whoever would want to draw close to him, understand the harsh judgments of God have to be something that you have to come to terms with. Because if you refuse to want to come to terms with that, then just know this, you will never be as close to him as you could be, as you say you want to be. You have to go through that rite of passage. You have to go through the experience of the acceptance of the judgments of God. And so Job was brought out as righteous amongst God's own judgments upon him. You say, well, that's crazy. No, it was, it was, it was, it was Satan. I remember, I, I read it. Quiet now. Listen to the scripture. God says to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? Satan brought it out? Really? God brought him up to Satan. God opened up the can of worms. God initiated the whole process. And if Job was here, now he'd be like, can you just leave me out of it, please? Can you all just like amongst yourselves talk this out? I don't want to be a part of this example process. And little did he realize, five months later, his life would turn upside down, literally go through hell on earth, that no one will ever experience the depth and width and height and length of that trial. But that is the reason why they are used in that context of contrasting righteousness among sinners. Noah contrasted against God's, the flood. Here you have the captivity. And here you have the trial. But they were all experienced deliverance through judgment. All of them did. Here God judged humanity. Here he judged Judah. And here he was just, <laughs> he, was, he was revealing himself to Job. And that is why those guys are mentioned. Because no one else can check those boxes. No one else can check the box. Oh, 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 oh. I was the righteous one when you judged humanity. You were really, Moses? Really? Were you really? I don't think so. That never happened. But Moses was the greatest prophet that ever lived. But he, as a sinner, only Christ is greater than him, and Christ is God. So, I mean, come on. Right, but he wasn't in that list, because that's why. Oh, 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 I was the righteous one when we went to captivity in, in, in Babylon. Where are you now? Then where's your name in the list of what happened? I, I, I don't see. But Daniel was. Oh, 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 I was the one where God revealed himself through all judgments and trials known to no man ever before on the face of the planet. No, you weren't. Job was. And only those guys can say they experience those things. And that's why they're brought up in Ezekiel. They have a uniqueness, a uniqueness of not just their righteousness among sinners, but within a context of experiencing God's judgment, they were delivered. And that, I hope, answers your question. They just let you tell me to answer that question satisfactorily, yes or no. Uh, he's saying good explanation. Thank you. And All right. That, What's that? He is. Job a type of chosen one, and Noah a type of invited one. Is that a valid? No. No, it's not. And Laney said, I would not have figured that when I see a stone. Yeah, um, no, that's not valid anymore. Job is by far, if you're going to be technical about that, what you just mentioned, uh, I would say that, that um, Noah and because Noah was a um, was a was a was a one of the sixty fruit virgins, 
uh, 30 fruit virgins, I should say. He, he's up there. I look at him as a foolish virgin because of what he did with drinking of the wine. So I see him as a foolish virgin, not as an invited one. That's insanely low. He was a foolish virgin in the ra reality of the maturity of his faith, but he got, he got off the kilter of not being a builder and went to being a vineyard guy again, and he got caught up in that process. However, he was still, again, uh, wise within what he had to know. Uh, Daniel was definitively to me, I think, again, Noah represents both sides of the 60 fruit before the flood, then the 30 fruit kind of person after the flood. He kind of represented both kind of people. He a wise virgin before and a foolish virgin after. So he represents the wise and foolish virgin, 60 and 30 fruit and an East Coast person. I think Daniel represents definitively for me the faithful one, no doubt about it. But Job represents the friend of the bridegroom. He represents the high, the, he, he is, the, you cannot sell that guy short. He is by far above all those, above both those guys because of the uniqueness of the experience and the depth of what he went through is insanely, it's, it's huge, it's a big deal. Yes? Pastor, I think the vineyard was the original designation for him as the bridegroom. Well, remember, he had, he had for 100 years uh, went through uh, the building of the ark, as we know, right? He built for 100 years the ark. And so God's ordinal number is 10, multiplied by 10. So it's God's ordinal number ordained to it, you know, times 10. 10 times 10 is 100. And we have 100 fold, we have 100 fruit. They both match up to that years, right? But the reality about his being, uh, when I say wise, um, I see him as the wise virgin process of it is because of the fact that he actually had, you know, all that wisdom and knowledge God gave him to the dynamics of building a three-tiered ark. So it was a, it was a tiered ark. Uh, there were uh, two of the unclean and then seven and seven of the clean. There was dynamics of distinctions that he had to deliberate out that God gave him. It took God's wisdom and parted him to deliberate all that process out to build the structure to gather, to God gathered in. He had to then support that. So I, he also was overseeing uh, the ark uh, with his, um, his, his, family and of course he's called the he's called eighth the eighth you know from uh, the eighth after the, the uh, of the second the first Peter second Peter uh, where he's called the eighth Noah was so I see him as the resurrection type of the resurrection the type of a person who gets a part of the resurrection now uh, the first portion of the resurrection right so all that could still be true to your point of the hundred fruit person and then the vineyard would then validate that because the vineyard is fruit yield and grapes and so forth, and that would be validated of that. Um, however, when you see him uh, in the vineyard, he for 100 years was a, was a builder. And then all of a sudden, he's in the ark for a year and 10 days, and he gets off and he plants a vineyard. And because we know it was a 20-year period that went by because God said he wouldn't dwell with man 120 years. Well, since Noah built the ark, for over, God used him to build over 100 years. Then afterwards, we know that 20 years went by, or 19, I should say, because it was a year and 10 days on the ark. 19 years went by, just short of 20, which 20 marks a year, the time of trial and tribulation, right? 20 is a year, you're, you're being tried by God. Um, and so you have that aspect of God, you're accountable at that point as well, and you see him then getting involved in, not purposely, but I believe, unknowingly, becoming drunken and then you have everything that God began not to dwell with them anymore because of the incest and so on. But the reality is that what happened there, I, I see them as, as again, him being one who to typified at that time a foolish virgin who didn't bring the extra measure, speaking to the knowledge that God imparted to him for a hundred years of he was a builder and now he went to being a farmer. It doesn't make sense. He should have been building cities and building homes and Instead, he was cultivating a vineyard. Doesn't make sense to me uh, why he would why he would have done that. You know, uh, and he knew right away to sacrifice some of the clean animals that God didn't tell him to do. So obviously, he knew that seven clean, and, and therefore there's there's disposable ones to give sacrifice of thanksgiving to God. How do you know to do that? Because I think he had the wisdom to do that. He knew that, and that's just that's what you're supposed to do. But then after the ark, he then later, it doesn't make sense why he would go to build a vineyard. But I see what you're saying, and that's fine. Yes, sorry, my apologies. Pastor, it also the fact that he survived in the flood as a type of an invited one going through the entire uh, just those two things, right? 
It, it is adult teaching, but here, here to tell you the point of that, remember this is before people understood what the 144,000, because he's a type of that person, 144,000 soon medicos for it. If you remember, he actually is a type of that person who in the first half of the tribulation, um, when he goes through, if you remember, the 60 and 30 fruit go through the first half, right? But there are other soon medicoi that go through the entire thing, right? So he's that soon medicoi person who is on both sides of that fence, as we just saw earlier from Revelation 14, 13. You could be an unfruitful, unfaith uh, unfaithful, unsanctified, reconciled soon medicoi who then becomes a faithful one, right? So you have that, there, there's both good and bad amongst the soon medicoi, and you see that with Noah. You see good and bad in him, which I believe is typifying of the soon medicoi. You see a faithfulness and an unfaithfulness among the soon medicoi because it speaks to their lack of going forward into the hundred fruit yield aspect where they gain that precious faith promise. So they do, in fact, the soon medicoi go through the whole thing, right? But they're not invited ones. They're not of the sporos. Those are of the sperma. So I think that is old teaching. It is old hat. I think that you're probably written down there. And if, no, no offense to that. I'm just hopefully bringing out why that was different and why that is. Because back then we didn't see that process of it. Um, and that's why. So we kind of fit that square peg in that round hole, if you will. Because we didn't see that dynamic of Sumedicoid being faithful and unfaithful. Both groups existing amongst one category of people. Yeah. Yeah, which, again, that's correct, which soon medicoy, um, because remember, some of those soon medicoy uh, people that are left behind are, I mean, I see him, he's, he's a, yeah, because those that are left behind, they, they grow up to produce more fruit yield than what they initially had, if at all. So, yeah. But he's also, uh, but he's also that type of person that many would say. Well, I could say he's a type of the sixty and thirty beforehand because you could say the ark typifies him being ca caught up. Because remember, the flood did rise and, his, and the ark was taken up, right above sea level, or above I should say, there was no sea level above mountain level, but it raised up high, right? So you could say he was caught up because he was, right? He wasn't caught up to heaven, but he was raised up. He was caught up into the ark, and he was, the, the ark was kafar, atoned, it was pitched atoned. He was actually, uh, you know, atoned, he was kafar, the ark is Christ. And so he was put in Christ, and he was raised up because of his relationship in Christ. And so it's interesting how you could say the 60 and 30 fruit were typified in the first half of Noah's life, and then the last half of Noah's life, he re represents um, you know, the foolish virgin or Ian or the soon medical. I think his typology is not, my point I'm saying to you is, I don't think his typology is isolated to, to just the 60 and 30 um, uh, wise foolish virgins or just the soon medical. I see his type as being dynamic depending on what side of the flood you look at. I think on the first side of the flood, I see him as definitively to me, a wise virgin. After the flood, I see him as a person, because uh, now, now when, he's on, when, he's, when the flood comes down, he's on the ark, I see him at that point, he's still uh, in wisdom uh, in that point, but when he comes off the ark and he gives his sacrifice and so on, the type begins to change and morph a little bit, because now you see him becoming unfaithful, which is typifying some character traits of a foolish virgin and of an unfaithful student medical, either or, depending on what view you want to take, the prior flood view or the post flood view take the prior flood view, then he was a foolish virgin. If you take the post flood view, then he's an unfaithful student medical. So it all depends. So that's why I'm, it's, I'm not trying to be double talking here. I'm just being straight with you about what I see from his side of it, that he represents a dynamic of that group of people that is in fact, um, you know, two character traits are there. There's a faithful part and an unfaithful part of his character traits. But God in his wisdom, which is awesome, uh, highlights that he was righteous. So that's why I'm hard pressed to say he's just soon medical as unfaithful, because I want to highlight, God did not highlight the end of his life, right? Where he was, you know, drunken and had the incest. God instead in Ezekiel highlights the first part of his life. So because of that being the real influencer for me, I think that that makes him in my mind by far, first and foremost, a type of a wise virgin. 
by a 60 fruit yield by far because of God's statement of him being righteous in Ezekiel 14, 14. Everything else becomes a secondary type to me because that's more so how we see things play out. But God saw it in holistic sense of what he was from the beginning. That, that's, that's how I'm saying. Yes? When you said, what did you say about before the flood? Before the flood that he was a type of a, of a wise virgin. Because of the because of the wisdom, not, not just the dynia, but the sunimi wisdom he had to have of all the detailed work that God was giving him to do of building the ark for a hundred years. And he's also called the eighth, the resurrection, you know, so he represents the resurrection. So I think he just has that sense of of that. And I think that God's, you know, reference to him in Ezekiel 14 really puts the import that his type has to first and foremost be seen as a good type, not a bad type. Because he's, you know, even though he did experience his life at the end was not that great, you do see at the beginning it's tremendous. And I think that's the bigger emphasis there. Because you got to remember his life was, he lived a long life, you know, and 900 years I think it was roughly. And you had this chunk of years, the bulk of his life was defined as righteous. You just can't wash that away because of a vineyard experience. Is that okay? Yeah, I think that's, that's. So I think in defense of either whether you think he's an invited one or unfaithful to Medicoy or a foolish virgin, you can't let that be the dominant view because that represents in totality a small piece of his life considering the large dynamic of his life that God said in Ezekiel 14 mattered more to him. So why wouldn't it matter more to us? You know, that, that's how I, that's me. That's my rule of thumb, taking God's lead on that. How God sees somebody is how I'm gonna see somebody. You know, That's how I do it, yes. Yeah, I definitely do. Kn I definitely believe that he did not know. I definitely believe that he had no idea. That was a genuine mistake of typically taking grape juice and drinking grape juice. The next thing he knows, he's drinking wine. He didn't know what wine even was. So I think it was a genuine mistake, an oversight, an, un an ignorant reality, but one in which he wouldn't have even been engaged in if he wasn't in that activity. Um, so that's kind of what I see that. That's an ignorant um, careless action that was not intended, but was a result of being in the wrong position that brought him to that action. He shouldn't even have been in that position, in my opinion. In my opinion, he shouldn't have been in that position to begin with. But because he was there, he made a bad judgment that in his, in his defense, he did not know. So I don't think it was intentional. I'm gonna go get hammered tonight. That's not what happened. Yes. Yeah, I, I believe that all 100%. So he was basically, the stage was set for him to be uh, blinded to the truth of what had happened in the canopy and the fermentation. I think the point and principle God's pointing out is you're not going to know things that he knows. Your job, my job, is to do what we do know. And he knew that should not have been his position. In my opinion, there's nothing before that time that could convince me or you that God gave him any indication that his position was to plant a vineyard and to grow a vineyard. There's nothing, zero, that speaks to God telling him that, to him somehow imputing that, to him somehow extrapolating that from his interaction with the Lord God through his life and what we see recorded of him. There's nothing that leads us to see why he would have justified doing that. And therefore, I think the lesson learned is when God veils truth to you that could cause harm to you, and later on you fall into that harm, you can't blame him. And you say, I didn't know, that's not my fault. He's like, what you, what you, what you did know is you shouldn't have been in that position. Fair? And you're going to go, yes. Then it doesn't matter what the action you did was done in ignorance. The action was only tempted for you to do or only becomes uh, there for you to do it because you were in that position. You shouldn't have been in that position to have that be something that was even a choice. You know, that's the problem. Yes, sorry. Yeah, before they used to, yeah, because when, when you go visit a vineyard, which, you know, I don't, I'm not a big wine drinker, but I know that wine's in the Bible, Jesus turned water to wine, and again, 
I'm not allowed to drink wine like at all. People in Christ can do that. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just that you have to do it in a moderation aspect and in a very uh, defined way of which you don't get, you know, lose self-control or lose your, your ability to, to act accordingly. Um, that's clear in Scripture. But it's not like illegal, if you will, from a spiritual standpoint. So wine's a good thing. Jesus even said, I'll drink the, the fruit of the vine, you know, I'll do, it at, I'll do it again in the kingdom. And again, Jesus turned water into wine in Cana, a celebration. But the reality is that, remember, wine is in and of itself the fermentation of the, of the, se- of the skin of the grape is what makes a great taste of a wine or not a good taste of a wine. So any vineyard person in the room of California, they'll tell you that. That it's the skin of the grape and the ability to maintain and sustain the longevity of the, of the grape's uh, harvest period of time and then to then let that, that, that seed, that grape you know, uh, skin shrivel down and all that stuff and all that and sit in the, in the barrels or whatever. It's all that time that makes it taste to what it tastes like. And people love that stuff, right? So the reality is that that it wasn't like they cru- they used to, uh, the way you said that, I'm not sure, you, I think I know what you mean, but I'm going to make sure I'm clear on this. So the grapes before weren't getting the sun, and therefore the skin wasn't being shriveled, and it wasn't causing any fermentation later when it was picked and crushed. Whereas now, not only is the skin getting shriveled up, which causes a preset ability for it to have a different taste through the fermentation cycle later, they, they didn't even have the skin being shriveled up because there was no sun coming down like it is now, beating down on the fruits of the land. It wasn't like that. They didn't see skin shriveling up on the grapevine back then. Didn't happen. It was a perfect utopia. So not only was the skin shriveling up, that should have been an indication, hello, but when, they, when it got actually through the grape juice and they had it, it would sit for a while and it fermented, so the first indicator was, how did you not see that the skin on the grape was, was shriveled up a little bit? But that, doesn't that kind of clue you in that wasn't normal? But but they don't know what to think, you know? They don't know what to measure out against. And then they go over there to the, you know, so forth, to the fermentation. Yes? Randy said, not sure where I was going with that thought. So, but anyway, I'm, I'm, I digress. I'm not getting involved in how wine's made, but I'm not a vineyard person. I'm just saying, I remember what I heard from California. So, I answered that question you said satisfactorily that, okay. So then we go to um, Psalm 89.10. That's pretty straightforward, actually. It's not as difficult as you may think. So let's go there, and at first it looks difficult because it looks kind of like a head scratcher, but in Psalm 89.10, it says this, Thou hast broken Rahab in pieces as one that is slain. Thou hast scattered thine enemies with thy strong arm. And then it looks like he's talking about Rahab the person from the city of Jericho. You're like, wait a second, Rahab was a Hall of Faith person in Hebrews 11. She had the spies under the flax on her roof. She had the skull thread out her window, remember, and they, they spared her. What you mean, crushed her in pieces? What you talking about, man? That makes no sense, right? That's because the Rahab the person is not the Rahab mentioned here in Psalm 89, 10. The Rahab here mentioned, this Rahab is a, is a mystical... Uh, Randy said, ah. Is a mystical reference... to Egypt because this Rahab was known as a demonic sea monster of the Red Sea. And if you think about it, the demonic sea monster of the Red Sea brings to mind a crocodile, which was their chief god of the Nile, right, the crocodile, and then they would as Moses turned his staff, or God did, into a crocodile, and he ate up the other crocodiles. It wasn't a snake, it was a crocodile. He ate it up, and you say, good gosh. Well, when that happened, he, that's a d- image of the sea monster, demonic sea monster of the Red Sea, that God was saying through Moses then, as he is here in Psalms. So, ooh, scary. You, you're, you're a created thing. You are nothing to the creator. As God told Job. And when the dragon shows up with the fire and the, and the lightning and, and that shield of like all those scales and you can't kill it, under the sea he comes from, comes out of the sea. And when he comes on the scene, carnage and death ensue. And you're scared out of your wits and you kind of like, you know, soil your pants. Yeah, remember that? You're scared of him? Job's like, yeah, I am, a lot. Yeah. And God's like, um, 
you do realize I made him, right? So why are you not afraid of me? Job's like, <laughs> didn't think about it like that, see? Didn't really consider that. And that's kind of what the contrast here in Psalm 89 is. God's just, as usual, kind of like doing this number, like, yeah, so I took the sea monster. I crushed him. This, th this thing that you so call for, so afraid of. It's a big deal. It's a big deal. And God's like, yeah, anyways. Um, and then I was suing over this time. <laughs> he's, just, he's just mentioning how he just cast off things that are so-called his adversaries. Like, no, it's the, old, it's the old jest. What's the opposite of God? People say Satan. Wrong. He's not his equal. Don't even do that. Don't ever answer that question with the word Satan. Say, what is God's opposite? It is not him. It, it, the, the answer to that question is nothing. Even that's a wrong answer. You can't answer nothing because nothing, you, there, then you're saying that it's equated to, to the greatest. You, you can't even say, you, it's, it, there's, there's no answer to that. The, the answer to that question is there's no answer to that. But people have fallen into that mindset that Satan is opposite of God. No, he's not. No, he's not. A created thing is not the opposite of the creator. That, no, that's a contrast, not an opposite. There's no opposing adversary to him. There is people who want to act like adversaries, who are acting like adversaries, but there's not truly an equal to God. There's no opposite of him that is equivalence. There's no equivalence. There isn't one. There's no equivalence to God. So he's going through Psalm 89 as if to point that out, to say, oh, you got a demonic sea monster, and I raise you. I took care of that. What else you got? Oh, you have this false god, and I got that too. What else you got? That's basically what he's doing in Psalm 89. He's like, <laughs> whatever. So it's just God showing off. So that's what uh, Psalm 89 tends about, about him saying, I crushed that into pieces. You know, the greatest country that were the civilization, civilization got together and made their first you know, cultivated people in Egypt, which is where, again, our people today, which, yes, I did see the Black Panther movie, for example. People say, oh, oh, I loved it. No, there was two lines in there that were off. And one of the lines the guy says is, Africa is a cradle of civilization. It's a cradle, cradle of life. No, it's not. No, it's not. Stop the lies. This narrative needs to stop. Life started in Mesopotamia, my friend. New East of Africa. The Middle East known as what we call, oh, I don't know, Asia? Come on, man. That is not Africa. It's another continent. So stop it. The cradle of life. No, it's not. No, it's not. The country of Egypt started there, yes, where they came meanies and all that stuff. Men became civilized into some cultures and all that stuff. Granted, I'll give you that. But it's not where life began. Stop that lie. Stop that narrative. It is a lie. It's a lie. It's a lie. It started from Mesopotamia, the Garden of Eden. That was due east of there, Iran, Iraq type of thing, okay? It's not Africa. Secondly, he points out that, that you know, white folks are in charge of all the, they're the fault of all the evils of slavery. No, blacks sold blacks, and then Spanish sold blacks, and then whites sold blacks, and we're the last ones in on it, and it's an evil of humanity problem. It's not a white problem, it's a humanity problem. Humanity is inherently evil. And we will all find ways to sell each other out when push comes to shove. Our survival instincts are evil. You know, people sell their own family for money, for crying out loud, even today. I mean, why does that shock you that different, different skin tone people exploit people? It doesn't shock me. me, me people are, we are evil sinners. So it's a human issue, not a, not a white skin issue or a black. It's a human issue. We just exploit each other all day long. We're just bad humans, okay? It's that simple. Don't make it into a skin color thing. It's bad humanity. That's what it is. So I digress. Now, Brother Laney, Psalm 89.10. Did I, in fact, answer that question for you satisfactorily? Yes. Okay. So Sheila can't answer satisfactorily yes or no, but I'm going to go through her questions. Sheila says, Matthew 27.52, the saints that were... What? So Sheila says, the saints that were raised in Matthew 27, 52, she says, did they have solical bodies? And these that were raised after the resurrection of Christ, let's go to Matthew 27. We all know the verse. He says, and the tombs um, were opened, Matthew 27, 52, 
and many bodies of the sleeping saints were raised and coming forth from the tombs after, after his resurrection went into the holy city and appeared to many. So, she'll ask the question, were they raised to solical bodies? And the answer is yes, they were. You say, well, how do I know that? Because Jesus is the first fruit of the resurrection. He says so. And as the first fruit of the resurrection, he's the first fruit of the harvest that's in view. You can't be a first fruit of a harvest that's not in view. That makes no sense. Because you would take literally and wave the offerings of the barley or wheat harvest to say it's time for the barley or wheat harvest. So he's the first fruit. He's the first of that group of that fruit yield to say I'm here, right? So he's the first fruit of those who have these solical bodies, which is what Jesus had, a solical body of flesh and blood, flesh, flesh and bone, but no blood. He was raised a solical body, right? And he, again, was raised in that way. He said, touch me in my hands and my side and know that I, I'm not a phantom, I'm not a spirit, not a ghost. And they're like, what? He just approved the point. He goes, you got some fish? They're like, you're joking. You're going to eat food, but you have no blood. And you don't really need to eat, so what's with the whole you got fish question? I want to show you that a solical body with flesh and bone can digest food. Or maybe I'm using the wrong word, can consume food. <laughs> I don't use the word digest. I don't know what happens when it's in. I don't, I don't know how that works. But I know that he, he's consuming it, that's for sure, right? So, okay. So because he's, because Jesus, Jesus himself, Yeshua, is the first fruit of the resurrection, and they followed after him, then he's in a solical body of flesh and bone, then therefore, so are they, right? So that's what that's about, right? So then you have, you have also, um, the next question Sheila asked was about a lot of depth into the Greek participles. You don't have to go through all the different scriptures that were referenced, but Sheila's referencing 1 first, first Thessalonians 4.13, as well as um, 1 Corinthians 15, in reference to how the Greek participles are used. And the question that Sheila, you ask is, is does it mean anything? Does it matter? I don't want to say it doesn't matter, because that's, that's not true. You have a great insight and great question about the Greek grammar and participles. Is there a question I missed, babe, or a comment? Babe? Babe? I'm sorry? Is there a question or comment I missed? Well, uh, Todd had disconnected, and now um, he's going back. Oh, okay, I thought I missed something. So, so we're almost finishing up here with the last two questions left. So Sheila's question about Greek participles, she said, does it matter? So the answer is, yes, it matters, but not in a very um, high priority of, of issue that changes the, the meaning of the verse or the wording. It just adds to the understanding of the wording. Okay, so what do I mean by that? Well, an aorist tense represents an action in a past tense, okay? But does it always mean it's referencing a past act, depending how it's worded? You could say, I'd be devastated if you ever left me. Devastated past tense, I, I, would, have, I would be devastated, past tense would be devastated, talking about a future event that would leave me devastated if you did this. I'm like, you see, because so how the aorist is used does not always mean it's a past act. It just means it's viewing a past, a result of an action, which means it, it's looking back to the past. It doesn't mean it's actually in the past per se, but it's looking to a past event and its result now. Okay, does that make sense, I hope? So, so the aorist is a result of a past act that could in fact, and it, how it's worded and the, partic and the participles that it's using could be referring to how that how that is uh, currently being stated or stated in the future about if this were to happen, how that, it's, it, so it's not, <laughs> it's not as clear in how it's being, so it's just the grammatical structure of, of the words. Now, the rendering of these participles is bore out in the tense of what it's intended within the verse itself. The next thing to talk about is indicative. Uh, so the, the indicative, um, grammar tense and the passive grammar tense and so on represent different, um, so the indicative is actually a, a, an adjective 
used to describe the verb. So it's used in a sense uh, to, the, to, 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 again, to add more. Uh, so he was, he, so we say in English, I was running briskly. So running is the verb, and briskly is describing how I was running, right? So an indicative way of using the, the tense is describing the verb. So does that change the doctrinal meaning? No, it just adds flavor to it. You know what I mean? It's like, does it change the fact? It's like saying, I had spicy barbecue. Well, I had sweet barbecue. Are they both barbecue? Yes. One's just, well, that's a noun. It's a bad example. It's a noun. This is a verb. Um, you say, I was cooking. I was cooking, uh, I was cooking quickly, I was cooking slowly. I was still cooking. The image is just different, me going fast or slow, right? So now I'm describing the verb of how I'm cooking. So the fact that I'm cooking doesn't change. The, the meat of the, of the definition of the verse doesn't change, or the doctrine. It's just, it adds light to how. It, it's describing how something was done, right? So that's the indicative. So then you go over to the, the passive, which is a mood. And then the mood actually describes uh, more so, it's describing the object of the verb and the connection the two have together. So I'm saying things like, well, I'm cooking, I'm, cook, I'm, I'm cooking rapidly the steak. I'm cooking rapidly the fish. Well, because of the meat, being referenced in your head, I say steak, you think longer time to cook. I say fish, you think shorter time to cook, typically, right? So rapidly shows you how I'm cooking, but because of the, the object in view, you already get a picture in your mind of the time frame, net result is going to be less because of the, of the object that's being, you know, I'm cooking rapidly, I'm setting on fire rapidly cement. I'm setting on fire rapidly wood. Uh, hello, one's going to catch fire, one's not really going to catch fire, is it, right? So the object related to the action is what the grammar mood is talking about. So when it says passive, it's talking about how am I actually, uh, the description of the verbing action related to the object, how is that inter interacting to each other? So again, does it actually change, again, the doctrinal meaning of the verse? I would say no. Does it change, again, some understanding of how the objects and the verbs relate to each other? Absolutely, because that's what the grammar is supposed to do. So all it does is, is expound on and kind of pull back the curtain of, of more of the understanding of, of the two connections of verbs and nouns, of adjectives and the descriptions of those things and, and how they correlate uh, to each other. So I'm not sure. Sheila's not online to say, does that answer your question? Um, God bless your heart, Sheila. I know you're across the pond, but you have such a great insight here into this question about participles and grammar. And, and I, I would say this, that, that there's no doubt that it's going to enlighten and, and show uh, some, some depth of appreciation and deepen a meaning. I don't think that's, that's without question. It's gonna, God didn't just use it for nothing, right? So it's gonna deepen the meaning and it's going to, it's going to um, uh, at best case scenario, at, at, at least case scenario, it's, just, it's going to just pull back the, the onion of the details and just to, uh, to see what you already have seen at surface level, it's gonna be validated by the grammatical structure behind the scenes. So it's kinda like you say, I pushed the starter and, and then something went through and shot through to the engine and, and it sh fed fuel into the carburetor, everything you know started, right? So you kind of know that, but all of a sudden, technical terms are being used to tell you what you already know. It didn't change what happened. It didn't change what you already knew. It just, it just used the technical terms to define what you already knew. So sometimes it's going to use, it's used to just nothing but to validate the technicality of what you already see physically in the verse. And other times it's going to expound the, on the depth of, the, of, of appreciation of what you already see. It's not going to change the meaning, it's gonna deepen it. That, that's what I would say. So hope that makes sense. Hope that's going to hopefully resonate uh, with some sense, I, I hope. But again, participles, grammar, mood, tense does not change the doctrinal verse meaning. It does either A, in my opinion, my opinion, 
it's going to either A, validate the, the details of what you already see from the Greek language of the words itself, or it's going to deepen what the Greek words already itself say because it's going to add more flavor as to how the adjective is being used toward the object and a little bit more of a deeper meaning at best case scenario. But I don't see it changing the inherent meaning because the words themselves are the meaning. It's, it's the deeping of the meaning that may be added by the grammatical text and participles. Hope that helps answer the question. So again, does it matter? Yes. And a source of changing dynamics of the doctrine? No. At, again, best case, give some deeper meaning. Least case, it's going to vindicate or validate uh, what you already have seen and the words themselves and what they mean. It's going to then validate um, how it is that grammar was used because of that word definition you see and how that was interrelated inter to the sentence. Okay? I hope that makes sense for the rest of you who didn't ask the question, but it was Sheila's question. You can see it's very insightful, very, you know, in intuitive of, of the actual details. Um, babe, you okay? Uh, I, if I, I missed the question or something, sorry. All right, so last, uh, we're gonna read about Paul's letters. I thought I saw your hand, sorry. I can't see sometimes because of those things are in the way. I thought I saw your hand, sorry, my apologies. So Paul's letters, and Todd asked the question, or somebody asked Todd the question, hey, and there's a movie out now, and I have not seen it yet. There's three movies out now that are uh, Christian uh, orientated. There's the, if I can only imagine, uh, God is not dead, light and darkness, and then there's the, um, the Apostle Paul. I understand the Apostle Paul's about uh, starting off with him being in the prison. It's about uh, Jim Caviezel, who played the character of Christ, who's now playing the part of Luke. Um, and people I've talked to at work just raved about that movie. Um, people emotionally raved about, if I can only imagine, they said it was like The Shack, which kind of makes me go, okay. Because The Shack had the character of God off, but the emotional story was fantastic. The storyline if you take the character of God and they take it with a grain of salt, but you take the, the storyline of the heart of a human being and how that was, that was very touching. But the character of God part was a little bit, eh. But they said, if only, if only I could imagine it's like that, right? Anyways, the Apostle Paul, they, I, don't, I haven't seen it yet, but I've heard nothing but good things. People have said that it's a great uh, uh, movie that depicts how he wrote the book of Acts and God's character building through him. Some of the things that I was saying to people about what I know, what we have shared in the book of Acts, how God showed us that character building of Paul, they said there was no mention of Barnabas. There was no mention of, of his uh, depth of growth uh, in relation to his um, interactions and relationships with John Mark, Barnabas, Silas, and the like. I thought that was kind of odd, uh, being that they said it was about his growth in Christ, but you left out the guy that was the most important person in his life when he first started to walk with Christ, which was Barnabas. It's kind of important, that's kind of odd. He left off his best friend. He didn't even talk about him. And they didn't talk about the correlation between the baton being passed from Peter to Paul, because he went from the voice and face of Christianity and Peter, God did, then he used Paul as that face and voice. And there was no mention of that. Nor was there a mention that Peter and Paul were both killed in the same day, in the same place, region, I should say, of Rome, not the same exact place, but in the same region of Rome, and there was no mention of that, they said. So I thought that was that interesting, but anyway, I haven't seen it. I want to see it still. All those movies I want to see just so I can have an understanding and people will talk to me. But how did they know the letters of Paul, right? So the, the answer to that question is this. So Paul would, he would, first of all, he would, he would, he would be in prison, writing the letters, the bulk of them he wrote from prison. So he would dictate those letters, and they were written by Luke and so forth, some people say. Other times, he was given a pen to write with, and he'd write it down. I have no problem with you saying he dictated to Luke to write it down, and many folks believe that some parts of that did happen. So it's still the Lord speaking through Paul, but he's just using the hand of, you know, of, um, uh, of Luke. That doesn't change the inherent scriptural honoring of the inerrancy of God's word and how God did it. Uh, however, the question would still remain, did they actually have a literal letter that was literally sent, and then they passed it around. No. So what had happened was, first of all, uh, the letters were written, and then they were read aloud to the people. And this goes back to what, if you think about this, it's a great question, because it brings to mind the question and the mentioning of why David 
which say in Psalm 119, thy word I've hidden in my heart that I will not sin against you. And the answer to this question you have that your friend had, Todd, is interesting because it relates to something that you didn't even ask, but I'm going to talk about anyways, and that is from the Old Testament to the New Testament, even though you had the old 39 books all in one place in the Torah and the Psalms and the Prophets, you had that all encompassed in the synagogue and the temple or tabernacle area, you still didn't have it passed around to everybody's houses. To, no, 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 that's not how it worked. You had to go to the synagogue, to the rabbi, to hear it, right? So the reality is, is that the, when you heard it, when you went to Talmud school or you went to the synagogue reading or the feast days and you heard God's word, the only chance you had to, to, to recollect God's word or to reference God's word or to, or to rest in God's word was to do what? Memorize it. Because you had, you had no reference point of physically going back going, is that what he said? You better have memorized what he said. Because if you don't, then, th then you're gonna have to wait till the next time you're in front of the reading of the Torah, the scripture, for you to hear what God says. Because you can't just open up a book just at your house somewhere in the desert region and just look it up. They didn't like that. So for thousands of years, their way of study was to attend a congregational assembly or attend a place of holy high holy place that God called holy and then hear from God audibly and they had to memorize it. Now you know why scriptures in Hebrews say forsake not the assembly